Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session uh, of uh, CCTV debate. My name is Li Sixuan from CCTV. Uh, we are going to discuss the digital disruption of finance and internet finance. So internet finance uh, is uh, not uh, the internet version of the traditional finance, but uh, it's a n totally new business model. And this totally new business model is changing the whole financial world. And uh, we uh, have uh, uh, experts uh, here on the panel, so I would like to introduce the panelists with us today. Mr. Huang Yiping, uh, who is professor of the National School of Development, Peking University, uh, who is uh, also sitting on the Monetary Policy Board of uh, the Central Bank in China. And uh, uh, also we have uh, Andrew Pengen Han, uh, who is the Group Chief for Innovation Officer of the Standard Chartered Bank, and also Ms. Tang Ning, the Chief uh, Executive Officer of Credit Ease. And uh, Kuba Kwan, uh, who is Chief Executive Officer of uh, Far Capital from UAE. So this is also being televised on the website of uh, World Economic Forum. And the English title of the session is uh, The Digital Disruption of uh, Finance. So disruption is a very interesting word. Sometimes uh, when we translate disruption into Chinese, uh, it can be negative and positive. And so, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask all of you, uh, in the future, the traditional finance, do you think they will be totally changed? Please raise your hand, please, if you say yes. You think it will not totally be changed? Uh, it depends on the definition of disruption or ch totally changed. I think the essence of finance uh, is the same, but the format will be changed. So, Iqbal, I would like to ask you, Iqbal, you are a banker, uh, now you have become an investor. Uh, you used to be a very experienced uh, banker. Uh, you are working for HSBC. Uh, you are the founding CEO of uh, HSBC Amana. And uh, so you mentioned that uh, technology is democ democratizing the world. So why? Technology is helping the banks serve their customers better on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is also opening up new opportunities for financial intermediation using the technology. But my own view is that the banking model as we know will continue to exist till the business design under which the banks are supervised and controlled is changed. So you think the old soldiers, they won't die and they wouldn't fade away? They will and not, they will change, but they won't fade away. Andrew, you agree? Uh, I, I agree with what he's saying. It's true that banking is at an, it's at an inflection point, And a lot of people think it's being reshaped by regulation. And that's only half the story. The other half is technology. It is a key enabler for banks, for digitization and innovation. And I think in the next few years, the way we know of banking, will change quite significantly, and I think there'll be a lot more collaboration between the banks and the technology companies going forward. Both will continue to exist. We are saying uh, that the uh, form uh, uh, of the bank will be changed or may be changed. And uh, so uh, we are talking about commercial banks or the capital market. And uh, so I was told uh, by one of my friends, um, uh, Veronica Mars uh, is a, a US uh, uh, episode. And uh, they are trying to make that uh, a TV episode uh, into a movie. Then they have a kind of a crowdfunding on the website. And uh, if you donate 1,000 uh, uh, US dollars, and uh, you can visit their studio. And uh, uh, if uh, you can donate 5,000 US dollars, then the key actor uh, will announce uh, your name uh, in public. And uh, so uh, they, through crowdfunding, they gathered uh, 5.7 million US dollars. Uh, so it's a, actually a kind of a crowdfunding. 
uh, for making a film. And uh, equity, crowdfunding, and uh, all other uh, new forms of uh, internet-based finance, do you think that will change the capital market? Like a PE, like a, a traditional capital market functions. So, Ms. Tang, uh, I served as an uh, investment banker and also a uh, PE. Uh, so, crowdfunding is a new way of uh, funding. Uh, it can enable more people uh, who are interested in participating in innovation and entrepreneurship uh, to do so. Uh, however, whether in the United States or in China, uh, crowdfunding needs a leader. Uh, actually, a leader is uh, someone uh, who is an experienced PE expert or investor or a venture capitalist. Still, we need a leader. Uh, so still, we need a leader to, to lead the crowdfunding. Uh, so it's not a pure crowd uh, funding, at least for now. I don't know whether in the future the big data uh, will uh, will change the world and uh, anyone, any individual can use big data to make a good analysis of the situation. Uh, Professor Huang, uh, I uh, read some of your articles published uh, on the website. You mentioned that uh, internet economy in China is leading the whole world. Uh, does that mean in China uh, those traditional businesses or traditional industries may be disrupted uh, more fiercely by internet? Yes, uh, the third party payment or micro lending or P2P. Uh, actually, we have seen that in China um, because uh, uh, we are uh, quite advanced uh, in internet finance, uh, we are leading the world uh, in changing this industry. Uh, you mentioned commercial banks, investment funds, uh, they are facing a lot of difficulties and challenges. And uh, the essence of finance is funding and investment, try to bridge uh, the investor and uh, the issuer. Uh, we are trying to solve the asymmetry of information. Banks, uh, financial intermediaries, capital market, they are trying to solve the problem of asymmetry of information. Uh, so whether internet can help us uh, solve the, pollution, solve the uh, problem of uh, asymmetry of information, it is the essence uh, whether internet finance will change everything. Actually, internet uh, has huge amount of advantage in solving the problem of asymmetry of information. Yes, uh, Tencent or Alibaba, their platform, uh, actually, they rely on two advantages. Number one, uh, actually, through mobile terminal, you can find your transaction target. Second, uh, data. They get the data. They have the data and analytical capability. And so Alibaba and Tencent, they use their data to uh, understand the market and to make a good analysis of the market. So we should just stop, uh, just a pause for one minute. Okay. Shall we start? Uh, we resume our session. So just now we are discussing uh, there are different formats 
of uh, business models, uh, P2P, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, traditional financial institutions, and they are trying new business models by adopting internet-based technology. I uh, read an article which is relevant to uh, Standard and Standard Chartered. Uh, so Dianrong.com, uh, P2P in China, uh, get uh, C round uh, financing. And uh, Standard Chartered is the leading investor uh, to make investment on that uh, dot com. So I would like to uh, ask uh, Andrew, why P2P? Why are you making investment in P2P? It's strategical investment or it's just a financial investment? Uh so as an organization, we, we uh, do invest in a few uh, mature and growth stage companies. Uh, we look for companies that offer some strategic uh, differentiation. And in this particular case, we like their business model. We like the fact that they work in uh, collaboration with the banks uh, here in China. And the uh, most uh, interesting aspect is I, I deal with a lot of companies in Silicon Valley in UK and in uh, Asia. And we find that uh, while some of these technologies, when they are developed in the US, they tend to be very, uh, very developed country centric. So when we try to adapt some of these in our emerging markets, in our footprint in Asia or Africa or Middle East, they don't necessarily uh, work very well. They're not very suited for dealing with multiple currencies. They're not very well suited for dealing with markets which may not have a credit bureau, uh, a different infrastructure. So, so a lot of companies in China are perhaps more suited for the emerging markets environment where the credit infrastructure, uh, lack of bureaus, et cetera, is, uh, is more appropriate. So we do look at both options, uh, both models. You are the chief innovation officer of Stanchart. And then for a big banking group like Stanchart, like currently you probably have your commercial bank and you have your investment banking arm and you have your direct investment arm you're the innovation officer. And so to put it more innovatively, in 10 years time, what kind of a bank will we see? I think in 10 years time, most of the banks will look very different. Most banks will uh, probably collaborate and partner with a lot of technology companies and they will be much more customer centric than they are today. They'll be using more technology. Uh, customer will be at the heart of everything that's happening. And uh, the, the, the technology companies will also work with the banks a lot more. Uh, while US and China do offer very large markets for companies to operate on their own, they also realize that when you go to smaller markets like ASEAN or Middle East or African countries, it's very difficult to figure out the environment in those countries. It's very difficult to figure out the regulatory landscape <coughs> and partnerships <coughs> work better. So we'll probably see banks which are starting to look a bit like technology companies and technology companies that are partnering with the banks. I think in the future what we will Do you agree? That the technology companies will be doing the fintech research, but banks across the world will be choosing to change the uh, model on which they work. So you could see innovation coming in, for example, in Ukraine, a private bank is offering Google Glasses for customers to look at their statements. You could see a small bank in a small country using technology to move forward. And two kinds of models would, would arise. One is those who are on the leading edge and those who are fast followers. If you are on the leading edge, you have the first mover advantage. If you are a fast follower, you can align the technology with a business model and a distribution platform which Anju talked about in the collaboration and partnerships. Uh, we mentioned collaboration for many times. But uh, uh, internet uh, finance is not just a simple concept. We can use Google Glass uh, to read financial uh, statement, or we have other stories, such as uh, large banking institutions, they have apps and they have some online channels, but are they uh, the real uh, internet finance in the future? I think uh, it might be a diversified uh, situation in the future. Uh, today, the internet finance uh, still uh, provides service um, 
which are not provided by uh, conventional banks. For example, those services to the micro and the small enterprises, uh, be it Alibaba or Tencent, they provide a lot of uh, services uh, which are not provided by traditional banks. Uh, later on, uh, they are investing in some technologies. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, even large banks provide some online financial services, still the user experience is different. Uh, because conventionally, the large banks are to serve the uh, large customers, while for internet companies, uh, their target groups are not those wealthy uh, large uh, customer base, but uh, ordinary um, customers. But one thing is uh, evident that with the uh, internet technology development in finance, uh, we will minimize the possibility of using cash. Uh, we don't need to go to the counter, or we can reduce the frequency to go to the counter. So there are all kinds of possibilities for the uh, transformation of banks. Uh, large banks have uh, their staffs and uh, uh, a lot of branches. They might be the advantage of them today, but not for 10 years' time. Today, um, or when I was young, I still think about the treasure bill and uh, the uh, stock was issued in paper, but now it's all electronic transaction. And paper um, bills are becoming a kind of uh, old-fashioned. So in the future five years, what do you think will disappear? I think uh, internet finance, this term will disappear. Because after 10 years, the internet, the technology will become a inherent part of finance. So it will become finance instead of uh, uh, internet finance. Uh, our understanding of technology transferring uh, finance is on one hand enabled, technology enabled finance. So technology will help to improve the current product. The other is technology driven, uh, which is to create uh, the product which is non-existent before. Because of the Internet of Things, the big data, uh, there will be more and better services provided. So we think that in 10 years' time, the Internet finance will become a norm so that the uh, term Internet will disappear and will become finance. So maybe after a few years, if we still have this uh, session, our um, agenda will be designed in a different way. I uh, basically agree with Mr. Tang because internet eventually is a kind of technology. It's like uh, ATM. And after ATM is invented, uh, drawing, withdrawing money becomes more convenient. So internet, on the one hand, provides a channel. On the other hand, uh, analytical uh, analysis. But uh, it doesn't change the nature of uh, financing. The investment in banks in the last five to seven years had been in the area of mobile banking, uh, online banking, more of customer facing stuff. Whereas what we are going to see more of in the next five to 10 years will be uh, also automation and digitization uh, for the back office and the middle office. We'll probably see more use of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, use of natural language processing for customer service, uh, robo advisory for wealth. Uh, so, so we're going to see a lot more of automation in those uh, areas to, uh, to streamline the whole customer experience. And you asked about what will disappear. I think one thing that will disappear is the plastic that we use as a credit card. I think payments will get to a point where it will probably be using uh, mobile phones or biometrics or some wearables, and we won't see that much of plastic. Yeah, but just mm. some people say just some people just love it, love the design of it. <laughs> I think in the next five years, what would also happen is that analytics, technology will come in together with psychometrics to create new form of scorecards for the venture capital aspirants in the global markets and also for the SME industry. So already, for example, the Kennedy School of Government in the US has a SME scorecard 
and a venture capital scorecard which is being used in countries like South Africa and others for the banks and the governments to partner into a program to fund SMEs and venture capital. So this is technology being applied in a major way. This will democratize financing for new ideas and new business models. So I see this as a big growth area. And to add a question, and just now Professor Huang uh, said that branches will uh, reduce in the future and the artificial intelligence will uh, replace a lot of uh, uh, human um, work in the future. We know that the uh, big banking groups uh, have uh, thousands of uh, employees, so where do these people go in the future? I think with the uh, improvement of productivity, it's not necessary for everybody to work five days a week and eight hours a day. People can s uh, spend more time on leisure. Uh, maybe we can rest for four days and have three days of work per week. Uh, maybe their work will not disappear. I think internet will help the finance to reduce the asymmetry of information, especially in China. Our financial system is still focusing on uh, banking as uh, indirect financing. While for direct financing, the proportion is lower. The big difference between these two is that uh, direct financing uh, need the, the investors themselves to do the um, analysis. But now the general public cannot do that. Uh, only banks can do that. But uh, if we have uh, big data and analytical tools, we can help the individual investors to do the analysis themselves. And in this way, the indirect uh, financing will shrink, while direct financing will have a larger proportion. I don't need the banks to help me or the intermediary service agencies to help me. I can direct invest. Uh, when I having, uh, was having the financial course at school, uh, we learned about asymmetry of information as well. With the internet help in the future, maybe we can have a symmetry of information, an efficient market. So uh, what will be that like, Mr. Tang? Uh, our understanding is that um, at the end of the day, still we have to combine online and offline uh, approaches. For example, uh, some simple and standardized things can be done through internet. But come to think of it, some complicated like insurance product or the taxation planning or even uh, the inheritance of uh, uh, fortune wealth or the, uh, writing a will, it's not very easy to do them through cell phone. Uh, so these service-oriented and customized services still need the human uh, approach. So these uh, services still need offline services provided by human beings. And also for SMEs and uh, the owner of micro-businesses. Uh, take insurance, for example. They still need uh, people's um, promotion. Uh, now we talk about O2O, it might not necessarily be online to offline, just one way. Maybe it's a two-way, it's an and, it's not two, uh, online and offline. Uh, we mentioned P2P a lot of times. Talking about internet finance, I asked a lot of friends, especially the audience, uh, people are very interested in this because P2P has a large exposure in media nowadays. But um, if I summarize uh, the feelings of the uh, general public of P2P, uh, they have expectations, but they are uh, fearful as well. They heard that uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, uh, profit, for example, 10% of uh, profit, but it's also highly risky. How do you persuade the people to accept a P2P? And this model uh, has uh, a long-term history. At that time, back in nine years, it's not even called P2P. We don't even know uh, such innovation existed in US and Europe. In early years, when we educate the market, people ask me, 
So what does P2P mean? Uh, what does it do? Are you banks? I said, uh, we are not banks. And then people turn away. But today, uh, P2P has already become an integral part of the internet finance in China. And China is one of the uh, P2P market in the world. On the one hand, as Mr. Huang said, we have the natural demand to, uh, to serve the uh, SMEs and micro business. On the other hand, today we can uh, utilize uh, technology to promote it. So we have two driven forces. What are the advantages provided to the customers as uh, um, lenders? Even if they just have uh, hundreds of thousands of RMB, they can um, participate in that. Before, it was not possible. And secondly, you can um, choose your uh, borrowers. And so you can uh, scatter your um, fund into different borrowers. And for borrowers, um, before, they were not encouraged by bank lendings. But uh, today, uh, through the innovation technology, uh, they can be covered. We have uh, studied of uh, the moral issues of uh, uh, those um, speculators. So we would crack down on illegal financing. Uh, these are important things. Uh, with such regulations, uh, there will be less and less um, people who escape um, the law. So be it a moral issue or a legal, legal issue, um, literally, uh, P2P is a kind of a platform. We can just charge a service fee instead of provide a guarantee. But in China, a lot of P2P lenders, they are not banks, but they provide a guarantee and they, uh, ha they enjoy the spread. Somehow, they work as banks. But in the future, we will try to avoid that. But the government's instruction uh, do not speculate, uh, spe specify uh, how do we do it. So for credit ease, do you need to transfer or transform? Uh, the leading P2P players uh, place differently uh, compared with what you said, uh, such as funding pool or uh, principal guarantee. Uh, starting from day one, a P2P, uh, uh, or at least the credit ease, avoided that. We don't do that. Credit ease and other P2P uh, pioneers, we just uh, consider P2P as an uh, information um, platform. So with the government guidance, Uh, they would uh, take care of a lot of uh, moral issues and uh, moral hazards. Even if uh, you are were willing to do P2P, uh, can you actually control the credit risk? And we will also do uh, anti-fraud um, investigation. So in terms of uh, data collection and data uh, judgment, we would also do more work. Mm. So when we talk about uh, internet-based finance, actually uh, the credit control is very important. And uh, so in a big data age, uh, we can score the credit uh, of uh, uh, any consumers. And so uh, for individuals, uh, uh, we have a uh, different uh, um, scoring system uh, for the credit level of individuals. Uh, in the future, maybe we can have more credit rating uh, agencies and uh, uh, we are uh, offering different dimensions of the credit uh, rating or credit uh, level of uh, consumers or individuals. Uh, we have uh, Sesame 
credit. Uh, in the future, maybe we'll have a green bean or red bean, uh, sesame. Maybe one individual. Uh, uh, it is not uh, necessary for one individual to get a 10 credit report or scoring report. Who should be entitled to have this, that kind of uh, credit scoring work? Today in China, of course, the central bank, uh, the People's Bank of China, uh, is doing uh, uh, the credit scoring. Uh, actually, um, uh, the early or the Sesame um, credit, actually, they are based on the database of uh, central bank. Uh, of course, um, in the future, maybe the central bank or regulator or the government, actually government agencies, taxation, power grid, uh, they also uh, can use their own information. Uh, if we can pull together all these sources of information, we can judge um, the credit system, uh, credit uh, level or score of uh, one particular consumer or individual. So in the future, whether uh, we should pull together all these sources of information or we should do individually, it depends on the future uh, trend. So do you, do you think uh, what will be the, 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 your expectation? Actually, some uh, agencies, government agencies, trying to uh, pull together all this information. I think that the credit rating agencies obviously would play an important role. If you combine this with psychometrics, you get a better picture. But additionally, there is now software available which can take the central bank guidelines, compliance guidelines, know your customer guidelines, and feed it into the system. And they can independently validate if there is any violation. And I believe this technology, this is a fintech company which is doing this, this will change the landscape and will bring a transparency which will make P2P funding and all these new platforms give them greater credibility. And the key thing is to make sure that the government guidelines are adhered and these softwares will do an independent check of that. You're talking about uh, technology. Uh, Andrew uh, actually has a lot of uh, background of uh, ri uh, risk management. Uh, currently investing in uh, any kind of algorithms in terms of scoring or risk management in general? So uh, from a from a peer-to-peer -peer lending perspective, not just China, what we also see in a lot of other countries is, uh, first of all, what they are doing in terms of making credit available to small businesses and micro businesses is really good. Uh, these businesses are now able to access credit uh, from the marketplace lending platforms. And in the past, uh, they were not able to do so because typically, they're not the target segment for uh, most big banks. And, and the, the P2P companies are also able to use uh, machine learning, uh, social media, et cetera, better. But there are just two risks that I do want to highlight here. One, our experience shows that uh, use of social media data, use of psychometrics, is, uh, it's, it's useful and it provides an uplift to the basic credit bureau score. But used on a standalone basis without the bureau data or without the financial repayment history, it's not that predictive. So it has to be used in combination with financial data and the bureau data. The second risk is even in the markets where the bureau data is available, the question that comes up is that if you are a platform and if you are just making commission income from both sides, why would you care about the quality of the loans? right? And they, and they do care because uh, you know, the business sustainability, the ongoing access to liquidity depends on that because if the loans are not of good quality, then both the retail funding and institutional funding will dry up uh, very, very quickly. But from a retail customer point of view, I'm not sure if the customers really understand the risk. It's slightly higher return for significantly higher risk compared to a bank deposit. And that's where the transparency, the customer disclosures, the customer education for the investors becomes very important. And that's where the risks are significantly higher from an investor perspective. Actually, our discuss, discussion reflect uh, that uh, 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 internet finance is democratizing uh, the wealth, uh, as mentioned by uh, Ekubo. 
it actually um, lower uh, the hurdle. Uh, you are investor or consumer or micro business. Actually, you are getting more opportunities and access to this uh, financing market. So it, people and businesses are not substituting each other. Actually, it's a complementary to each other. So we're talking about uh, some technical uh, issues. Now I would like to ask each of you, in this uh, context of uh, internet, uh, internet finance, uh, so we're talking about context or scenario. So uh, in the 10 years, uh, it, what w will happen? Uh, what will be the scenario uh, of uh, internet finance? Maybe in the 10 years' time, uh, this word itself will disappear. So Ms. Tang, uh, would you please give us a scenario you have imagined? Uh, I wish 10 years later, if uh, the term of internet financing has disappeared, however, uh, it means uh, the success of uh, Internet finance is uh, achieved. Uh, maybe a robot will help our customers to do wealth management. Uh, we have a robot advisor in the United States. Um, in addition to robot, we still need uh, offline, reliable, trustworthy partners who offer face-to-face -face, uh, services. Uh, so it's an O and O, uh, online and offline. So in the United States, uh, when you enter uh, into a scenario of a bank, it's like a cafe. Uh, it's like a, a Starbucks. Uh, it's like a coffee shop. And uh, the people who are serving you in that bank actually is a very experienced banker uh, who will ask you uh, what is uh, your experience of uh, uh, as a user. Uh, so it's a kind of a experience economy. And the banker will ask you your user experience. So maybe in the future, the, uh, the, the number of days uh, working uh, for bankers uh, will be reduced. And uh, people only need to work for two or three days. Maybe the tourism will prosper. Uh, not only internet finance, the internet itself, including robot, will significantly increase the productivity. Uh, we don't have to work so long, except Professors, professors still need to teach. Uh, other people don't need to work uh, so many days a week. And uh, we don't have to have a credit card in plastic form. We don't need to have papers printing out so many statements. And uh, actually, maybe in the future, uh, cell phone or smartphone will disappear and something will replace cell phone or smartphone. And uh, so some physical form of finance will disappear. However, the essence of finance will still exist. Uh, uh, consumers may no longer uh, put their money as deposit in the banks, but they will put money uh, into other forms, uh, and uh, like insurance, like debt, and uh, or foreign exchange. Uh, people can make investment and wealth management by themselves when the asymmetry level of information is reduced. Uh, when we have higher level of transparency. However, for high-end uh, wealth management, we still need to have a uh, uh, face-to-face uh, consultancy. Uh, but uh, for simple wealth management, you don't need these experts with a high level of expertise. Um, the hurdle will be reduced, the threshold will be reduced. Uh, but now we still have uh, to rely on cornerstone investor to uh, support your project. But in the future, we will have uh, more crowdfunding. Do you think this will be the situation? And uh, maybe a lot of films w are actually made by our friends, not by big investors. Yes, uh, uh, equity crowdfunding, we put our money together, but we still need a leader. We still need a coordinator to lead the investment. So for now, for this level of uh, uh, information asymmetry, it, uh, 
asymmetry of information level is still very high. And uh, so uh, local people, ordinary people, still need uh, a general partner or, or, or leader to lead uh, and coordinate the investment. In the future, uh, if one day we can solve the problem of uh, asymmetry of information, anyone who uh, can enjoy the transparency of information, of course, we can do that. But it's only a dream for now. Uh, maybe the technology in 10 years' time can, can help us change this uh, world. Professor Huang, that uh, the essence of finance will remain the same. People will still need the same services. But the way they are delivered and the channels will probably be different. Maybe people will be using virtual reality headsets to, to do their shopping, and then they'll be paying using some biometrics devices. But they would still be shopping and still be paying, and the banks would still be doing settlements and reconciliations at the back end. Uh, and and uh, if within the banks, the skills that are needed may change. There may be a need for more data scientists. There may be a need for more analytical skills. Uh, but you would still need people for the higher end personalized services. There will be democratization of finance. More people will have access to finance uh, and banking. So the, maybe television will disappear, uh, and I will lose my job. We don't need a, a, a master of ceremony. We, we need a robot. And be more financial inclusion uh, for in each area. Firstly, democratization of savings will happen. More access to venture capital financing through the scorecard and psychometric analysis better KYC, better governance as a result of technology and software, which can ensure that small and large institutions follow the same standards on compliance. But I think one of the biggest opportunity in 10 years' time is democratization of philanthropy to make this a better world. I think technology, innovation gives us that opportunity. Uh, we are anticipating this uh, very important uh, uh, future. Uh, governance, as you mentioned, is a very important word. Uh, so governance level are different in different regions. And so with such a rapid uh, uh, changing um, age, uh, what kind of uh, regulation we need? Uh, if uh, the regulation is too stubborn or too tough, uh, it will uh, stifle the, the development. Uh, what type of uh, regulation? Of course, we need transparency, we need uh, uh, due diligence, we need uh, information disclosure. However, we need a balance. We need a uh, lot of uh, financial innovation. Uh, if we queue at the very beginning, uh, the regulation queue any type of uh, financial innovation at the very beginning, there will be no innovation. However, the most key is the system. How can we prevent the systematic uh, risk from happening? Uh, s some of the problems are not a uh, problem. Uh, if the product uh, didn't work, uh, consumers have to uh, take responsibilities. So if no one takes the responsibility, then the problem will be big. So we should have a bottom line. However, usually regulation is lagging behind vis-a-vis -vis the innovation. Regulators usually didn't realize uh, uh, systemic risk is happening. So internet-based uh, finance, uh, one form uh, it's kind of a hybrid business. Uh, in the past, we have banking, insurance, uh, securities. However, internet finance is uh, hybriding everything. And uh, one smartphone can do all business. Uh, there's uh, no regulation on these uh, uh, businesses. Uh, however, in most of the countries, uh, there is uh, uh, segmented uh, regulation. And uh, we have regulations in the United States. Uh, so what will be the future of regulation? Uh, we have a few understandings. First, investor education is very important. Investor education, if it's very effective so that market participants know what they're doing. For example, in the US, if 
there is an institution or a platform telling the investors that I have an idea, I can help you with your wealth management, then the investors should ask for their past performance. They should ask, uh, what background do you have? Um, so that you can help me. But in China, the phenomenon is that uh, always there are people who dare to say and others who dare to believe. So I think uh, the investor education should be well uh, done. For example, uh, what each product is like, uh, what is its risk um, versus the performance ratio. Also, innovation regulation uh, need to adopt diversified approaches, not just uh, one department or one problem. We need the central government, local government, uh, industry associations, media, think tanks, and eventually investors and the consumers. It should be an all-round participation. It should be an inclusiveness and wise regulatory system. So two things. On regulation, because of the new uh, mixed um, business model, we need um, diversified education. Second, we need investor education. These are very important factors. Andrew? Digital reg uh, revolution that's going on. The regulators are also feeling the challenge uh, in terms of how to govern them, and we participate in many of those conversations uh, in this space. And uh, it's quite interesting. There was a paper issued by the UK government a few months ago where they were uh, they, their ambition is to be the fintech capital of the world. I think in the next five or ten years. And in that paper, one of the chapters is on how do regulators need to evolve to support innovation, but at the same time balance their goals on financial stability, consumer protection, misconduct, etc. The chapter is called RegTech. So you know how the how the regulators need to work in the technology world. So so we'll see how that uh, how that pans out. But I think in the future, most likely we will see uh, regulators regulating activities as opposed to just regulating financial institutions. So if if a non-bank is doing a bank type of activity, they will probably uh, you know it will probably come under their mandate. We are already seeing that happen on the payments front in Hong Kong and in UK. And maybe that's how it'll evolve in other places. I think it's a very important um, point. So the target of regulation is not just the financial institutions, but also financial activities. Uh, this should be a very effective thought. So what about you, Mr. Khan? I think uh, we start firstly from the policy perspective. Governments across the world have to choose between players or, reg or referees and empires. If government at the economic policy level gradually transition <coughs> from being players to referees and empires, they will have a much more effective market-driven mechanism. But this has to be a gradual process. But secondly, I think there is a fundamental reform of the financial architecture which needs to be addressed. The segregation of the payment system from the financial intermediation, which has been called narrow banking. Both the Vickers report in the UK and the Walker report talk about this segregation, which used to exist as part of the Glass-Steagall Act. This is a financial, this is a must to reform and we must get to that level. The way we are trying to get to it now is kind of in an ineffective manner through risk weightage, through Basel III standards, but we are not getting there. And the third point is that we need to have a harmonization of regulations at the federal level, state level. And the fourth point, which was aptly pointed out by other panelists, is education. Because it takes a long time to educate our population. I think taken together, we have the opportunity to have a deep impact on financial inclusion, democratizing savings, and philanthropy. So you have some similar uh, point as Mr. Tang said, harmonization of regulation. Also, you mentioned the education and its importance. 
this is a broad topic, but we have very uh, limited time. Uh, we have touched upon every aspect of the internet finance, but uh, in a, a light way. We'll leave the last 10 minutes for QA with the audience. If you have any uh, questions, please raise your hand. Hello. Hello, my name is Dana. I'm a global shaper from the Caracas Hub. And I have a question. You were speaking about uh, Okay. You were speaking about the 10 years and what are we going to see. And I was wondering uh, which challenge do you think we're going to see in terms of the technology is not going to be the challenge, right? You're saying we're already there, we're getting there. But what about interoperability, uh, digital uh, alphabetization, digital inclusion as well, uh, of, of course, regulatory frameworks. So which one do you think is going to be like the most important thing that we need to address in these 10 years to actually achieve inclusion in banking from everyone? and to reach that internet in banking that we're talking about. And second, uh, really quick, sorry. Uh, if, if you feel there's a balance in innovation in the FinTech field, uh, because we see a lot of innovations in terms of getting like the applications being, being smarter for like smartphones and these kind of things. However, for inclusion, uh, after the M-Pesa and pay payment with uh, SMSN, we don't see that much uh, impulse, right? Or I don't know if you have a different perspective on this that you can share. Thank you. Can I? Uh, I would say that they are not uh, mutually exclusive. I think we are going to see a lot of focus on uh, financial inclusion. We work with a lot of uh, telcos uh, in Africa, and we work with companies in the US that need to pay partners in Africa. And a lot of that happens through the mobile operators. And in the payment space, in almost every country, there's a lot of discussion now on interoperability. Because you know, if you keep on adding more terminals at the merchant's desk, or if you keep on adding different types of devices, the consumers get confused. So, so we will see uh, more and more happening in, in uh, both of those areas. I think one of the challenge would be data, big data, or data application to help risk the asymmetry of information uh, with more and more data. We should consider the ownership of data. Do they belong to the platform, or who's the owner? In terms of security and uh, convenience, how can uh, consumers strike a balance. It seems that uh, people born after the 90s uh, would choose uh, convenience more with their growth and with more and more problems occur. Maybe security will become a larger issue for them. How do we balance the two? Our understanding is that data should uh, be owned by consumers. So that's the ownership of uh, data. This is also a hot topic of uh, internet finance, including the third party payment. Uh, this is an international issue, not just in China. So you think it should belong to the consumers? Yes, it should belong to the consumers. Consumers should have the right to uh, ask relevant institutions to help them to create value out of their data. But in the process of operation, at least in current stage, it's not uh, very well addressed. So Andrew, in terms of banking sector, uh, banks also owns a lot of data. Uh, what do you think of that, the ownership? What is the relationship between data and the bank? Data And banks have to follow a lot of regulations around banking secrecy, uh, individual privacy regulations on what banks can or cannot do with the data. So uh, that's another example of where there is an asymmetry of information or there is an arbitrage in terms of regulations on, on uh, how there are lots of restrictions on the way the banks can use the data, the way the banks have to keep the data secure uh, versus some of the uh, non-banking entities. But I would agree that, you know, Customer consent should be sought before uh, using their data 
for multiple purposes. Yes, the authorization of uh, uh, consumers are very important. Yes, I think uh, a personal right should be protected. But uh, if all the data are owned by individuals or uh, consumers, uh, if we need to seek the authorization of our consumers at any time, then we wouldn't have big data analysis. Uh, we know some apps, uh, sometimes you just uh, randomly give, up, uh, give out the authorization. And uh, some uh, analytic tools can analyze whether you are a male or a female, and it can um, provide targeted advertising. So what is the uh, baseline or bottom line? Um, we're still exploring, be it individuals or institutions. We don't know uh, where the line should be drawn. Uh, maybe there are uh, more sophisticated uh, investors who pay more attention to security. It should be an awareness issue. But the boundary, it's like a game. With the technology development and the change of financial product, it should be dynamic where the line is true, is drawn. As Mr. Tang said, uh, this is a global issue. And anybody who wants to provide additional information? Which will be the biggest challenge in 10 years' time. There are thousands of fintech companies across the world who will address all the peripheral and integral issues around customization, customer's requirement, and alliances will be built up. But 10 years from now, if we haven't addressed the issue of reforming the financial architecture, i.e. segregation, segregating the payment system from financial intermediation system, we will continue to have the cyclicality and systemic risk in the banking system and from taxpayers' money, we will be bailing out the banks. And that has a big pushback for digitalization, for the internet banking, because when the crisis happened, banks become, central banks become very parochial, very protective. Those kind of barriers are not good for the democratization and globalization of savings, investments, or philanthropy. So to me, I think the biggest challenge is how do we bring a narrow banking system based on ethical standards and have a global appeal for that. Till we address this issue, we will be tinkering around the edges. So that is the biggest challenge which I feel. So we touched upon all the dimensions. But all in all, internet finance is changing uh, or reshaping the world. So to sum up, I found uh, one sentence in our guidance, as an emerging business, internet finance need to be driven by the market. It should also be uh, supported by policies so that it can have an enabling environment. So we look forward to this uh, bright and healthy future. I thank you very much for your participation.